Okay, so good morning everybody. Um, today we're going to do a so, little bit more of support vectors and you know, get multi detection, maybe a bit of regression. Let's see how far we get. Um, before we do so, the most important part again is let's look at our leaderboard. This time we have six winners, as in the fifth and the sixth one are dead. Um, yeah, I guess people are getting more with their name, which is more well. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, I'd love to learn some, right? Uh, so, if the top 16 would please come, uh, well, top six submitters would please come forward and pick up your prize. So, CY Wu and Hobbs, Pixie, why I what I mail. Let's give them a round of applause. Well done. Okay, so just to recall what we had, we have a large margin classifier, right? And we have, oh my god, an observation that is not linearly separable. Well, what are we going to do? Well, this would lead to an infeasible optimization problem because there's a set of W's that actually linearly separate this. So we basically add some slack and that's basically what you do, right? And so what we had to do is we had to then go and not just solve the problem of large margin At the same time, I want to also minimize the slack. So I want to therefore go and minimize you know, one over two norm of W squared. So that would be our standard large margin condition. And in addition to that, and okay, so we want to do this under the constraint that yi times w dot xi plus b is greater or equal than one minus psi i, but now we have to pay for the slack, so we have to pay c times sum over i psi i. Okay? And now, of course, I need to optimize not just over the w's and b's anymore, but I optimize over w, b, and psi. Okay. Before we look at the optimization problem in more detail, why different psi i for each, you know, x, x i, y i pair, right? Any suggestions why this might be a good idea? Some dimensions are going to be narrower than others. Correct. So you want to have a more fine-grained measure of how well I'm doing rather than just saying, well, okay, there's, oh my god, a single observation and it's really wrong and so therefore everything is wrong, right? You don't want to do that. This would be basically, if I had a single psi i, and this would have to hold for all the guys, then this would effectively do the following thing. It would say, well, okay, I've done really badly here, so therefore I don't really care how well or how poorly I do for everything else. That's not very useful. Um, any other ideas of what I could be doing with those psi i's? So yes, I want to have a single yes, psi i for each observation, but what, what else could I do in terms of those psi i's? Yep. Yes. So this is really useful. You can basically look at the psi i's after you've trained the model, and you decide that some observations are bad. And as a matter of fact, people have done this, and they wrote a paper about database cleaning. So essentially, what they would do is they would build a classifier, then they would check in this case for SVMs, but you can do it more generally, you check you know, all the points where your classifier does, does wrong. And then you just say, well, the classifier is right, but the data is wrong, and so therefore let's mistrust our data and trust the classifier. Which sounds kind of crazy, but it actually turns out that this is a really good way of finding, well, poor observations, poorly labeled observations. You know, if you overdo it, it's actually not so good. And furthermore, and this is actually quite interesting, even if I have some really badly looking observations in my data set. So we did this for optical character recognition and so on, 
we thought, okay, these are really poorly written or almost mislabeled. Let's actually remove them from our data set. And we retrained the model and we figured, well, okay, it would be better. Actually, not so. What happened is that the performance overall on the test set got worse. Why? Because, okay, any suggestions? The test data also had some of those weird observations. Okay, suppose I remove it from the test data. Why would it still possibly not be quite so good? That's a very good suggestion. Well, basically, you know, you have to draw a line at some point. Okay, this observation is still good and the other ones are not. And th those transitions are gradual. And our idea of what we thought was, you know, properly labeled and proper observations didn't necessarily match terribly well with reality. As people have hand, horrible handwriting, they will always continue to write in this horrible way. And so removing some of the observations actually made, made it generalized less accurately. So this is just like, you know, let's say you're preparing for an exam and you're skipping the really hard homework assignments. Right? Assuming that, you know, in the exam you get easy. And of course, we'll only ask easy questions in the exam. Nonetheless, questions in the homework, your chances of doing well in the exam will go up. And essentially the same thing happens here with Okay. So, but what you can also do is, and people have done this, um, you could add a square here. Okay. So, is the problem still convex? Who votes for the problem still being convex? Okay. Who votes for it not being convex anymore? Okay, and the rest is still asleep. Okay. So, um, yes, the problem still is convex because direct function, uh, you know, some of the squares, this is convex. Not all convex, not, not all quadratic functions are, right? Here's a concave function. It's quadratic, it's parabola, but just flipped over. But this is clearly a convex quadratic function. So the objective is convex and quadratic. I still have a quadratic program, and I can solve this. As a matter of fact, this problem is actually slightly easier to solve than without the square. The reason is the same as what you were, we had when we looked at the perceptron with basically, uh, you know, with margin. So same reasoning. So, good question. So, now let's look at what happens to a point here as it moves across the boundary. Let's say we have one point there, and it at some point pierces the margin, and, well, let, let's look at the contribution. So this is basically one minus yi f of xi, right? So f of xi is basically w to the x plus b. So for the linear contribution, well, okay, so here's what happens, right? So it's all zero up to that point, and then it increases linearly. And let's say here's one, so, so here's basically zero, here's basically equivalent margin of zero, and here is, well, basically here is where it's wrong, and here it's where it's wrong margin. So basically, this would be this would be where it crosses over the line, and this is where it, you know, is even on the wrong side of that large margin. So if we had a quadratic function, well, what would happen is we'd get something of this form, right? So parabola. Okay, this is maybe the most hor ugly parabola you've seen today, but okay, I guess the the effort counts, right? Um, so, yeah, basically, this has a slower slope in the beginning. So if I'm just getting the margin wrong a little bit, I'm not going to pay quite as much as if I'm violating the margin a lot. So this is why, in some cases, that actually performs better. There's one variant that actually performs best, and it's a hybrid of those two. And that's, for instance, what's implemented in the VW Optimi optimization code. It 
Let me just draw it for you because you can always piece it together manually. What's this function here? Let's say here's one, here's one, and it's a quadratic up to here. So it's zero all the way throughout. And then it increases linearly. So this is, in a way, the best of both worlds. It increases linearly here and up to the point where you get things wrong, the slope keeps increasing. Well, if an observation is really badly wrong, right, it will end up, you end up pay, paying a monstrous penalty to it. You don't necessarily want that. You want your classifier to at some point give up. Right? Because if you try too hard, then you might actually get a really bad solution otherwise. On the other hand, you want to have something where if you get things slightly wrong, well, you don't quite pay that much. And so this is basically sometimes what's called a Hooverized soft margin. Uh, Hooverized after Peter Hoover. So he's, in a way, the father of robust statistics. But that loss function, I'm not quite sure who can really claim credit for it, but John Langford would be a pretty good candidate. So in VW, his solver. Okay. Yep. Very good question. So the question is, why don't we do this? Right? I could have a ramp loss. Or I could have something that's maybe smoothed out here. Right? Um, this thing is actually called, I think, the psi loss. Um, unfortunately, can somebody see a problem with that loss function? It's not convex. Exactly. So in other words, um, you have no guarantee anymore that you will get the optimal solution. However, as I explained on Monday, you can find an iterative procedure which uh, basically invokes one convex optimization problem after the other, which will give you a local optimum of this. Right? And then it's more a question of whether you're content with having that locally optimal solution. But that's, that, that loss actually has a number of nice properties otherwise. And there's a very nice paper by McAllister and Keshet, I think from NIPS 2012, which prove quite surprisingly consistency pro uh, properties for this type of loss. Uh, 2012 or 2011, I'm not entirely sure anymore. But um, yeah, so if you're interested in that, this would be probably the paper to read. It sounds like the closer we make the loss to the logistic loss, the better performance we're getting. Yes. Is, it, does, that, does that actually? Unfortunately, not quite. So it turns out that the logistic is actually performs at least in that particular code that is implemented in VW, which I think the best description is the piece of code, unfortunately, um, performs ever so slightly worse than uh, the superized one. Uh, part of the reason being that, well, actually, it's not really clear what the reason is. Um, but yes. Uh, I would, in case of doubt, if I have a problem with a lot of noise, almost certainly start with a logistic. And if logistic sounds confusing to you so far, don't worry, we'll get to that shortly. So this is basically yet another loss function. There's like a big zoo of loss functions. At some point, there was a time when you could write a new paper for each new loss function. Those times, unfortunately, are past. 
OK, so now let's actually solve the optimization problem. So remember we had this, OK, we don't need that. So here's the optimization. We want to minimize, you know, w squared plus some of the slacks. And so just as before, go and write out the Lagrange function. The difference to before is that now we have those pesky size. So we have c times sum of its ii's. Now this strain here acquires a on top of that I have sum over eta i psi i. Question, why do I need this guy? The psi i's have to be non-negative. Exactly. Now, why should the psi i's be non-negative? You want to minimize the mar you, you want to maximize the margin. And the thing is that if some of the psi i's could be negative, I could essentially make good on what I'm doing wrong for some observations by doing really well for some others. And you don't really want that. You want to make sure that you're making a good solution for all observations. You want to classify well for all observations, as opposed to saying, well, I got this one really right, so I can really screw up the other one. That doesn't help. Okay, so now we therefore have additional slack variables for the psi i greater or equal than zero, so we call them eta's. Okay, and they'll actually all go away in a moment, but basically now of course at the saddle point where we minimize in W, B, and Psi and maximize in alpha and eta. Okay, so now we go and compute the derivatives, right? Everybody knows how to take derivatives, so the first two terms are utterly unsafe. They're exactly the same as what we had before in the hard into this. It's the same. Um, now, if we take the derivative with regard to the size, we get something interesting, right? We see, it's from that term up here, minus alpha i minus eta i equals zero. Well, let's dwell on that a little bit. So we have c equals alpha i plus eta i. We know that the alpha i's and the eta i's are all greater or equal than zero. So what that actually means is that the alpha i's are in an interval between zero and c, right? So as long as that's the case, I can always find the eta for which this holds, right? So in other words, as long as the alpha i's are box constrained, but this is called a box constraint because you have, you know, one of those for each of them. So overall, you know, if I have d of them, then I have a d-dimensional hypercube. Right? And so basically, I can always find a valid set of eta's in this case. Okay. And then what you do is you go and plug all those terms back into the objective. We have that w equals you know, what we had in the top line. We know that the sum of alpha i, y i vanishes, so that nukes all the alpha i, y i b terms, right? And we know that c minus alpha i minus eta i equals zero, so that actually the etas and size disappear, which is kind of interesting. So if you do this, and okay, who wants me to go through it in detail? Okay, not some, well, that's maybe three or four. So maybe we'll do another one later uh, because that's not an overwhelming majority. So if you want me to go through things in detail, you need to raise your hands. We're all of that story. And, okay. Anyway, so if you just go through that, it's exactly the same algebra as what we did on Monday, just with one more constraint. Then you get this as the, object, as the optimization problem. So the surprising thing is that the objective is the same as what we had before. So if you squint at it, you know, we have three places where the size appear, right? C times psi i 
minus alpha i times from and this is exactly eliminated by c minus alpha i minus eta i. So I can just drop those terms out. And that's why Okay. Now, what this really means is, well, sure, we have the alphas and the etas, but as I already discussed, I can always find some etas that satisfy this if I keep the alpha, alpha's blocks constrained. And so now the only thing that this from before is i greater or equal than 0. Now we know that the alphas have to be between 0 and c. So what does, does that really mean? Well, let's look at our optimization problem. And it, remember that the alphas were like you know, essentially virtual forces, how points could push in each way. So by limiting the, upper, the, the largest value of the alphas, what we effectively did is we said, well, each observation can push, but only can push so hard. And if it pushes harder than some number, then, you know, that's just the limit how hard it can push. And if it cannot push the hyperplane by more than that amount, well, that's it. So that makes our procedure more robust, right? Because now if I mislabel a point, well, it can push things a little bit in the wrong direction, but only up to some extent and no more. So you could almost think of this like, you know, you take this slab of a hyperplane, think of it as maybe made of rubber, and you're trying to push it in the right way, and if you push too hard, you simply pierce through it. Right. Maybe a not such a glorious way of imagining a constraint optimization problem, but I mean, I, can, I mean, for me, it helps getting a bit better. So, what I really therefore see is that no single observation can influence W by more than alpha, well, more than C. So, you know, if you look at our parameter vector, you know, we got again w equals sum over alpha i, y i, x i. And remember in the perceptron, if we had to go through the data many, many, many times, and we always screwed up one observation, the influence of that observation would grow without bound as we would iterate to the data over and over. This was essentially the reason w uh, why, you know, black and white, that game, was worked so poorly with the avatar in the end, because you overfit on the inconsistent behavior of the user. <clears throat> and in hard margin SVMs, again, you could basically get situations where each point would push really hard, and you might not get even a feasible solution this way. By limiting the force, it essentially means that you will never overemphasize an observation by too much. And essentially, the extent to which it can contribute is given by c. So if you make c small, what's going to happen? OK, any, con any suggestions? What will happen if I have a very small c? Then I might be making more errors, correct. And it also means that I am going to spread the influence over a lot of observations. If I make C very large, in the limit it will converge to the hard margin solution. Okay, so that's exactly what you would expect. So let's look at it in some pictures. And well, here's some data points, and I've picked C equals one, and I've solved it. And C, it's perfectly separable, so there two support vectors, one on either side, so there's one here and one up there. And so what do you think is going to happen if I increase C? And don't look at the slides. Okay. What do you think is going to happen? Is the margin going to change? Who thinks that the margin is, who thinks the solution is going to change if I increase C? Yeah. 
Okay. Who thinks it's going to stay the same? <coughs> okay. So who said, well, it's going to stay the same is right. So here's why. Let's look at our optimization problem, right? So we found two points. Everything is feasible. And let's say we found some alphas which don't hit this upper boundary. And I've already solved the problem optimally. Now, if I make this upper boundary larger, the previous optimal solution is still going to be an optimal solution, right? Because all I've done is just that I have one constraint that's really being enforced. If I'm relaxed, well, it's still not going to be enforced. So therefore, I get the same solution. Okay. So, not very surprisingly, you can't see anything as you increase C. Right? You can see that you can't see anything. Right. Okay, now, let's take that example, right? So now we have slightly more noisy data. Well, not really sure, but nothing's really going to happen. You can again see that you can't see anything. Okay. Now, here, well, let's see. You know, at some point we're going to hit the boundary. And still nothing's happening. Okay. But now, right? Well, I've just created. See that there are actually a whole bunch of points that are now inside that margin. So as I increase C, well, the SVM can actually work harder to expel the points from the boundary. Well, expelling the points from the boundary actually means just making the margin narrower, right? Because I only have linear functions. There's nothing fancy I can do otherwise, right? So yes, it gets a little bit smaller, and it gets a little bit smaller, and a little bit smaller, right? OK. So this is linear SVMs with soft margin. Yep? It changed a little bit because I expelled points from the margin, and so some points pushed a little bit harder than others. So yes, you're absolutely right. Both things happen, and you don't have any guarantee of what. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is arguably maybe a slightly worse solution than what we have before. So effectively, what you already saw here is a very mild form of overfitting. There wasn't really much you could overfit here, but it's already a little bit worse. So now, basically, at some point you want to solve this problem, right? So if you have you know, a small problem, like maybe a thousand, a few thousand observations, you can just use an off-the-shelf solver. Usually, the ones in MATLAB are really poor quality, sometimes don't give the correct solution, they are slow, and so on. So don't be too, too disheartened if your MATLAB solver falls over. Um, at some point, the Excel solver actually gave the wrong solutions. So don't use Excel. Maybe they've improved it since, but uh, yeah. Those toolboxes, unfortunately, are nothing to write home about. There's, there are better things like CVXOpt, which, or Cplex, also Gurobi, which is a more recent one, OQP, Object-Oriented Quadratic Programming Solver. This one's fairly nice, but you need to do a bit of work on your own. So it's basically a C library. You need to actually find your problem. Loquo, I don't know whether it's open whether it's freely available by now. But basically, any of those things would do a better job than, let's say, what MATLAB can do. So CVXOpt is free. Um, if you have larger problems than that, you need to do a little bit of work on your own. So the first thing that happened when people started using those classifiers, for instance, to recognize handwritten digits is they realized, well, Actually, all those points that are not support vectors, I can leave them out and I get the same optimization problem, right? Because they don't really impose any constraints. Let's just go back, right? So these points here, they don't really contribute to the solution, nor do those up, th up there, right? Because they are, they are constraints. They amount to constraints that are always satisfied. So I can't just throw those out. Now, what this does is it makes the optimization problem smaller. So this is 
of course, this kind of cheating is like, well, if I knew what the solution was, then I could really solve it really rapidly, right? But what you can do is you can <laughs> subset of the problem, throw out the points that, you know, where it currently does well, you add more observations in, and as long as the final solution does, you know, solves everything that you left out, and you can solve it on the subproblem that you have, you have a solver. This is what was initially. Yes. Check whether the constraint is active, which is very easy to read off because you just check whether the corresponding Lagrange multipliers, the alpha i's, are non-zero or not. If they're non-zero, well, we know that this point was probably useful. If they are zero, we know we can throw it out. Does anybody have an idea why this worked particularly well for handwritten digits? So, more of a data point, so around 1995, so when people had 16 megabyte Spark workstations, people were able to solve this in a nonlinear fashion, and I'll get to the nonlinear part, on about 60,000 observations quite comfortably. Okay, so a bit of calibration, you may not recall, but 16 megabytes means, well, you can store something in the order of maybe a 2,000 by 2,000 matrix if you're lucky. Right? So, does anybody have an idea why optical character recognition for handwritten digits was a particularly good application for that? Um, so hand handwriting is a simple problem, so to say. Well, it was not perfectly, hand handwriting is similar. Yeah, that's kind of getting to it. So how well does a handwriting character, basically how well does an OCR system usually work? Is it fairly accurate or is it fairly poor? I think most, usually by now it's fairly accurate, right? You get very high accuracies in the high 90s. So in other words, there had to be a classifier that actually classified most of the data correctly with high confidence. So that meant only very few observations were support vectors, which meant they only needed to store very few of them. And so what this meant in practice is that out of those 60,000 handwritten digits, for instance, on MNIST, only in the order of 1,000 to 2,000 actually were support vectors. And this gets us exactly to the 16 megabytes and the magic number for 2,000 by 2,000 matrix. So it basically meant that the only really relevant part of the optimization problem was a subset of 2,000 instances on which you could train. And that's why it worked. So that's why, for instance, for face recognition, it took a lot longer until people were able to do this. And I'll show you some optimization algorithms afterwards. Yep? Um, the demo that you're looking at takes binary classes. Does this look different with multiple classes? It's a little bit more complex for multiple classes, so you need to define what the margin is in this case. So, um, to well, without giving too much away already, essentially what you want to do is you want to make sure that the correct class is classified with high confidence relative to all the wrong classes. So basically, if you think about it, here we had that, you know, w dot xi plus b times yi had to be greater or equal than minus yi w dot xi plus b plus 2. So if you add that up and divide by 2, you get exactly the large margin constraint. So in other words, getting things right had to be much, you had to be much more confident about, about the correct solution than the wrong one. So we can turn this 
into a case where now we have, so in the simplest case, let's say we have a different W for each class. You now have W sub yi dot xi. And of course, you can get rid of the b's accordingly is, well, or you could just have a by here, is greater or equal than w y prime of x i plus b y prime plus, and then some confidence score between y i and y prime. This is essentially how this generalizes. So you basically have some cost for getting things wrong. So for instance, if I want to classify between cold and well, you know, it's a big disaster if I throw a diamond away, but if I misclassify a coal as a diamond, then somebody later on is going to pick it up, so I have a very asymmetric loss. And <clears throat> then I would basically have a different weight vector for each class. So you can immediately see that this here is, you know, upper bounds, this loss here. So basically for those instances where the penalty for getting things wrong is very high, I am therefore enforcing a very large margin, whereas for cases where, you know, it's actually very close, I would only enforce a very small margin. And that gives, you know, that large margin classification a new meaning. So let's say it's almost like, you know, when you drive on a mountain road and there's a steep cliff on one side and it's very flat on the other one, you will probably try to stay away as far as possible from the steep cliff, as on the other side, it's not such a big deal. So you will basically try to enforce confidence in different, well, you know, relative to the penalty that you incur. We're going to get into this in a lot more detail later on when we do structured SVM and so on, but question to ask already. Before we do this, we'll do a little bit of nonlinear separation. Yep? Is there a possibility that the small vector has a zero Lagrange So is there a chance that the SVMs will have a zero, uh, Lagrange, will, will have a Lagrange multiplier that is zero with it? Yes, that can happen. So recall we have the following Kuntaka conditions. Alpha i times, now here we have y i w dot x i. That's a very good question. Plus b, right, minus 1, minus psi i equals 0. So what happens is that, okay, so first of all, I mean, okay, we, okay, actually let, let's ignore the psi i case because you need to look a little bit closer into the optimization problem. But in this case, of course, you can have a case, situation where this equals zero and this equals zero. But that only really occurs with probability of measure zero. So in other words, these are very, very rare instances that you have a point that just touches the boundary but doesn't enforce the constraint. I can always construct such a data set. What all I have to do is just, you know, take an existing data set, solve it, and then insert another point that sits exactly on the boundary, right? That point doesn't really change the solution, so you wouldn't actually expect, you know, that, you know, the, opt the optimal solution is different. However, there is no guarantee that I get the same alphas out of it after running the solver. So the W will still be the same, but the alphas may be different. So what you've just done is you've now created a new optimization problem where you have an entire set of parameters which will give you the optimal solution, whereas before you may have had a unique optimal solution. So basically you've created something that looks like so, right? And now, in se so this is a convex function, but within here, the parameters themselves are undefined. I mean, not undefined, but any of them will solve it. It's a good question. Any other questions? <laughs>
which is what? So wy prime, what I'm now doing is I'm, each class gets its own parameter vector. So if I have three classes, let's say red, green, and blue, then I have a w red, w green, and w blue. Technically, only really need for k classes k minus one of them. You can always get rid of you know, the centering, uh, but it just <laughs> to be a lot easier to write it out this way. So that constraint? Well, so each constraint tells you something about the relationship between two classes, but it's one, one optimization with, you know, number of classes times two or number of classes squared, I guess. Um, so, what, so, so as a matter of fact, people have tried out multi-class solutions by just, you know, solving a lot of pairwise problems. You can do that. You can also solve them as a lot of one versus the rest problems, right? These are perfectly valid solutions. So if I have k classes, then if I look at pair, all pairs, I get order k square pairs, right? So this means you have to store a lot of parameters and you have to a lot of you know, SVM classification problems. On top of that, in, well, if you have a new observation, you just need agree on what well how many uh, problems to solve well I have to solve k minus one of them this is against all the other k minus one possibilities each of them one by one now the third way is to really combine all of those together into one big problem this is what we did here. There is actually some rather nice mathematics of how to convert some of those problems into it. That's not a big deal if you have, let's say, you know, 10 different classes. But if you have, let's say, 100,000 different classes, then it's probably a really expensive thing to do some of, these th some of this. And building a 100,000 dimensional classifier may also not be a good thing. But so what you can do is, for instance, use reductions. There's a very beautiful compressed sensing reduction that was done where basically they said, well, okay, this vector uh, with you know, 100,000 coordinates and maybe only one non-zero is obviously a sparse vector. I can randomly project it into lower dimensional space, solve a couple of regression problems there, and then work out back what the original solution is. So remember that Langford guy from before? He's also on that paper. So this is... I think Su Kakade, I'm not quite sure about that. And Langford. And they it's also Nip's paper, probably around two thousand and nine. And they got a best student paper prize for that. So this is one way how to deal with crazy large number of classes fairly efficiently. But looking at that in detail would be quite a bit beyond the scope of 10701. So maybe we'll do some of this next semester. Okay. So now let's look at nonlinear separation. So, uh, Tong Shang. This is a really cool paper worthwhile reading because it's such a brilliantly simple idea. It's, it's, it's very, very nice. <laughs> 
Now, remember the trick, right? A week ago, well, one and a half weeks ago, right? So, what we have here is we have, you know, linear separation problem, and you can write it out and you solve it, and fine, and we have our support vector expand. What I've already done is I've written everything in terms of inner products. So the cool thing is if you squint at it, you realize the entire optimization problem can be written in terms of inner products between XI and XJ only. Okay. So by doing this very simple query replace, right? Very simple. See the difference? Basically, wherever I had XI and now I have phi of XI. Where I had xi dot xj, I have k of xi and xj. You immediately create one of the world's best classifiers. So that simple thing was essentially a blockbuster paper in '92 by Bozogier and Wapnik. And if you think, well, it's so simple, you know, was it a big deal? Well, actually, it was, because one of the authors, namely Wapnik, had written this problem here. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is not what I want. This problem here before, prior to writing this paper. So sometimes the even very simple things can take a very long time just because you don't see them, because you don't ask the right questions. What's even more amusing is actually in his lab in the 60s, the guy who sort of laid the foundations to some of this was just essentially his office mate. So that's why. Okay, so don't underestimate really questions about this so far. Because while this trick is very subtle, it has fairly drastic consequences. Okay, let me repeat the question for the microphone, because this is a really good question. So the question is, suppose I have a really, I have that in a really, really high dimensional space, and because it's so high dimensional, it'll be linearly separable. By the way, that should be clear to everybody. If the points are in general position, let's say I have 100,000 points and I have a million dimensional space, they are you know, not in some linear subspace. I can, always linearly, I can always linearly separate them. So the question now is, well, in this case, by adding slack variables, can I get rid of the outliers or the wrongly labeled points? Effectively, yes, you can in most cases. So as a matter of fact, a lot of spam classifiers or computational advertising solutions rely somewhere on a linear classifier in a crazy high dimensional space. At least some of the published ones do. Um, and so, of course, you know, not all of those things are perfectly correct. So Yes, you do get rid of this by capacity control, because now, since you have so many dimensions, that's almost like having a nonlinear problem in the first place anyway. You have way too many dimensions in a linear setting, or you make things nonlinear by mapping into this high dimensional space, amounts to more or less the same thing in terms of solutions. So let's get a little bit more intuition by actually looking at one of those problems. So these are the very same data sets as before. But now, nonlinear kernel, in this case, a Gaussian RBF kernel. And OK, well, I can see that now the separating hyperplane is actually kind of weird. It's curved, right? Because while it's a straight line in feature space, it need not be a straight line in the original space. Because what happens is, you know, while I have phi of x dot w plus b equals 0. Well, the set of x's for which this holds need not be a straight line anymore. So this is some nonlinear function, right? So straight lines in Hilbert space 
don't amount to straight lines in input space. This is actually one of the cool things about the kernel trick that you can do a, a lot with essentially basic linear algebra and still get all the nice non-linearities without really paying for them. This is probably most obvious here where now my margin boundary, so these are now the support vectors, right? Who would have thought that a point really far away from the data becomes a support vector? Well, yes, because it, you know, here you're actually not that confident anymore. And, you know, as we crank up C, again, you can see that nothing really happens because we get this nice nonlinear separation. Okay. Now, let's take a case where, you know, we have more data. Well, more noisy data, right? So this is my separating hyperplane. It's actually kind of strange that over here, well, it, it would get it wrong, right? But since there's no data, I don't really pay for that. And as I increase, you know, the penalty, not much happens. But what you could see is if you squint really hard, you can see that boundary change a little bit between those two cases, right? So what happened is that there were actually, you know, look at this point here. There were actually one or two points which were slightly across the boundary. And by increasing that upper bound from one to two, well, everything got fine and now it stays that way. Now let's look at something a little bit more interesting where the data is more noisy. And here I have a whole bunch of points that are inside that margin. And now as I go and add increase the organization constant, you know, the solution actually starts changing in interesting ways. And so as I increase C, the margin gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And also the solution becomes you know, more wiggly. And it's not a big deal here yet because, I mean, still all of those separators by and large do really well. I mean, the optimal solution, because these are two Gaussians, would actually be a straight line, but for all practical purposes, this is fine. Okay. Yep. Correct. Uh, yes. Um, what do you do in high dimensional okay. cases? Right. Okay, so this is an awesome question. So the question is basically, well, you know, in two dimensions we can easily debug what's going on. In higher dimensions, well, you can't. So how do we know that our solution is good? So do you remember when we looked at Parson windows, right? We had that same problem. We have basically a problem where as we made our kernel width narrow and narrow and narrow, it actually fit the data better and better and better. But unfortunately, that didn't really mean that you know, our solution got better. It just you know, fit the data that I had at hand better. So it's called overfitting. And the first thing that you can do is you can use cross-validation just as you would have done for Parson Windows. So in other words, I just solve on a subset of the data Test on, test on the remainder and keep on doing that. And now, of course, if I do tenfold cross validation, I have to you know, solve 10 times as many problems. And that, of course, will give you something reasonable. And that gives you an estimate of how well you're doing. So you cannot visually inspect the data in general. So this is why I suggest if you try out a new algorithm, pick a data set where you can actually in some human way, inspect what's going on. So this is why low dimensional data sets are sometimes useful, images are useful, text is useful. Because in all those cases, humans are pretty well trained at analyzing fairly quickly what is happening in terms of the solution. But yeah, other than that, basically cross validation. Now let's look at the really ugly case, right? This was the noisy data. And as I now go in, well, the margin looks horrible, but the decision boundary is still fairly decent. 
And as we keep on increasing the upper constraint, it becomes something that's probably closer to abstract art. Right? So, well, bear in mind that the plane, this guy here, is still probably not that terribly bad. So, it actually means that, you know, even though it look, the solution looks really horrible and uneven, the boundary is still not completely crazy, so it won't do so terribly badly in classifying data. Here you're, you're just changing your upper bound. So Correct. The kernel method. What about changing the kernel? Would that make a difference? <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> and you can see that things go haywire really badly, right? So what you basically have, now let's do that. Right? So this is wide, a very smooth kernel. So basically you have two knobs now. It's actually more than two knobs, but if I just let you choose between, you know, this, or maybe that, or maybe this, then this already controls to some extent whether you think smooth functions or not so smooth functions are really important. And then by, you know, adjusting C, you essentially quantify how much with regard to this measure of smoothness you are going to let your solution get away with. Um, okay, so this is going to become a little bit more clear later on. Who's done splines before? Okay, so in splines, you probably remember that the find something that, let's say, for instance, interpolates the data with some, you know, and that is smooth at the same time. And then you can trade off, you know, the error versus the data, and it's the very same thing that's happening here. Question? Correct. Okay. So, um, yeah, we are getting to the heart of model selection, and um, we are going to go into a lot of uniform conversions theory and basically capacity control as we'll go along. So, yes, the, the question is basically, you know, how should I pick my kernel? Uh, so the simplest, okay, so there, there's a couple of, very straightforward things. First of all, yeah, use cross-validation and it helps kind of get this right. Secondly, if I have a nonlinear kernel, uh, then there's a very simple heuristic that actually works amazingly well. So let's look at our kernel matrix, right? So the original trick is probably due to Bernard Cholkov, except that he didn't actually formulate it in a computational way. And I have a blog post on actually doing how to do this computationally fairly efficiently and getting the parameters right. So k of x and x prime is, well, in this case, for instance, e to the minus x minus x prime norm squared over 2 sigma squared. Right. Now, if we look at our kernel matrix, of course, the main diagonal has all ones. And then we are basically left with deciding what our off-diagonal elements should look like. Remember the kernel matrix is basically, you know, how similar two observations are. Now there are two cases that you want to avoid. Can somebody tell me the two cases you want to avoid? Or at least one of them? Yes? So if I, if I pick C to be really, really, really large, uh, sorry, well, so a sigma squared to be really, really large, as in a really wide kernel, then I will get all ones on the off-diagonal entries as well. So this is then a rank one matrix. In other words, all observations are very similar to everything. And so, of course, I will not do very well in any nonlinear separation. Okay. Any other suggestion of what could go wrong? 
What happens if I make sigma squared really small? I will get the identity matrix. So that means we will basically have that an observation is only similar to itself and to nothing else. Both of those cases are bad. Because saying everything's the same will not help me classify. If I say everything is special, it doesn't help either. So what you want is that, you know, this kernel essentially differentiates between observations at a reasonable scale. So in other words, we want to guess the sigma squared that's kind of in the order of magnitude of x minus x prime squared. So you can squint at the data and you say, well, you know, it has d dimensions and it does such and such and such. And you kind of sort of get it right, but you can just measure it. So what you do is you drop xi, xj, and you compute the distance. Okay. You do that for maybe a thousand pairs, a thousand random pairs, not a thousand observations in all pairs, but a thousand pairs. And you take the median. And you take the point one quantile, and you take the point nine quantile. This gives you three candidates. You try out all three, cross validate over them, and you're done. And that's it. So if you look at the distribution over those distances, you know, it might look like so. You take the point one quantile, take the point nine quantile, you pick the median. And for those three different values of distances, you try out sigma, and it will work very well compared to a heavily optimized solution. And it just speeds up your code drastically. This is how you can set the kernel in a straightforward and slightly unique way. There are better theoretical bounds. Unfortunately, those bounds often have very ugly loose constants. That correct, and in the limit, they're good and all that. In practice, I have yet to see one of those bounds that be characteristic. Uh, well, if they are distances, then it's for sigma. If they are squared distances, then it's for sigma squared. But basically, you want this quantity here. You want this quantity here to be order one. And then you're in good shape. So this is, you know, nonlinear separation. So what I want to do a little bit is talk about risk and loss, just because we've essentially already led up to that. And then, well, next week we'll probably look at regression, novelty detection, and a few other things. And then at some point we'll do convergence bounds. But basically, you have two knobs. One is, you know, how smooth or non-smooth you want things within a given class. And the other thing is, well, you know, class. So for instance, if you had a polynomial kernel, you would get a very different set of functions out of it. OK. Any questions so far? Yep? So when we invoke kernels, the dimension of W is different on the number of um, Yes and no. So phi of x can be in an infinite dimensional space. So therefore, w, since it's a linear combination, is in the same space. However, the space over which you effectively need to optimize is given by the number of data points. So therefore, the answer is yes and no. So technically, w is in an infinite dimensional space. In practice, you never operate in that space. Good question. Okay, any other questions so far? Okay, now let's look at risk and loss. So remember what we had, right? We had this constraint quadratic program. This one top is really just a simple optimization problem. Now, what I can actually do is I can rewrite this by getting rid of the constraint. Think about it if I give you W and B, 
you can immediately work out what the optimal value of psi is, right? Because psi is equal then, well, the maximum between 0 and the amount by which I violate the margin. Any larger psi will just give me a worse solution, so I can immediately solve in closed form what the value of psi has to be. That thing here. Okay, let's just draw the picture. If I had, let's say, you know, this as my separating boundary, these are supposed to be parallel lines, right? Point here, another one there. And I have another one, let's say, over here. Then this distance here is essentially what amounts to psi. Well, rescale with W suitably, but I guess you get the idea. And if we then look at the corresponding loss function, here's what it looks like. So we have... Well, basically, yi times w dot xi plus b. And so, okay, it's a straight line. Here's one, here's also one. Basically, if I get the basically with margin greater. If I get things, we'll start again. Okay. okay. So now this is the same optimization problem, so the solutions are equivalent. Basically, what I've just done is I've actually written this as a problem of minimizing some cost of the data plus the penalty. And of course, pardon? So, sorry, let's just wait until they are done building whatever. Okay. So the vertical axis is the loss. This is basically this function max of 0 and 1 minus the That's the, that's the loss. Now, you can see that this upper bounds, this loss here. That's what we already talked about before, where somebody said, well, you know, what about something that actually flattens out here again? That's exactly what's going on. Now, here you see the picture. The one on top works particularly well. This is the logistic. That's this blue function here. You can see that and the green one is the soft margin. The red one is this hooverized log. The functional for what I showed you before. And you can see that all those three functions have a couple of things in common. Can somebody tell me some of the properties that they have in common? Asymptotically, they are linear, so they are asymptotic. If I get things right, at some point I'll stop paying. And if I get things wrong, logically, or some of them are linear, the rate and the functions are close, quite, but pretty close. Um, any other thing we have in common? All three of them are convex, which is good because I can solve the problem optimally. And all of them can be used in to get an upper bound on my misclassification error. So for this green function, it's trivial, right? For the blue and the red function, what I would have to do is I would just have to multiply them by the corresponding constant such that they sit above. That's all. So 
I can now turn this into an optimization problem, right? So I can say, well, you know, I want to find some function f which minimizes the classification error. So, okay, so this is a new term. It's called a risk. R of f, that's basically how well or how poorly I would do if I had access to the entire distribution over the x and y's, and basically I just check, you know, how often I get things wrong. What's the probability of getting things wrong for a particular x? And then I take the expectation over all x's. Okay. Now, of course, I don't have that. So the only thing I can do is, well, you know, for instance, here's my training set. Let's compute on the training set how many, things I, how many times I get things wrong. So in the context of your homework, for instance, R of f is, you know, essentially when you upload the thing and you see your score on the leaderboard. You can essentially assume that we have a very large supply of data on which we can compute things. It's not quite true, but for practical purposes, you can assume that this is what R of f is. What you have handed out with the homework is the empirical risk, you know, is something that lets you compute the empirical risk. So basically, you know, how well do you do in your training set, for instance? Right? And if you do a decent job, you can hope maybe R imp and R f and, and R will be close. And if you overlooked a lot, you would probably have noticed a couple of very frustrating cases where it works really, really well on the data set that you have, and you upload it, and it fails miserably, right? That's called overfitting. Um, the minimization problem for this, unfortunately, is non-convex, as we already discussed. And yeah, up, you end up you know, overfitting as you minimize the empirical risk. So what you can then do is you could, for instance, say, well, first of all, let's solve the non-convexity problem. We compute an upper bound, and we solve for that. That will do a little bit better. But then we don't really have the overfitting under control, which basically happens whenever your solution is you know, very, very, very much adapted to the training set and does nothing else. And so this is why you then want to impose a penalty. So this looks a little bit different from what we have before, because before we had you know, C times, you know, in this max, and we just had W squared here. So you can rewrite it into that formulation by just dividing by lambda. We have 1 over lambda m equals C. And you're done. So. And this complexity measure was, for instance, the norm of W squared. So a large margin, therefore, amounts to a relatively simple function to solve things. Now, there's an interesting side note, and it's kind of amusing, actually, that this happened. So in SVMs, remember we have basically this parameterization with C. And let's say you said C equals maybe 2. So we basically, you know, C times sum over I going from 1 to M. And I'm now going to use an abbreviation for this max of 0 and da 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 da. I'm going to write it as a loss of yi xi and f of xi, actually I can skip this thing here, just of yi and f of xi. And then I have plus 1 half norm of w squared. Right. Now I can put this over here and also divide by lambda. So I, this is equivalent to minimizing 1 over m, sum over i equals 1 to m l of yi f of xi plus 1 over c times m, well, 2 c times m times norm of w squared. So in other words, in this case, I have an empirical risk term, which now will converge, one would hope, as I get more observations to the true risk, plus a term which is order of 1 over m. So lambda would be order 1 over m. 
So why is this amusing? Because this is essentially what you would also get in a Bayesian setting, where basically your prior doesn't really change if you observe more observations. Your prior should always be the same, but you just get more observations, so it's basically, you know, your likelihood terms just keep on adding up. Quite often what you would see in a frequentist setting is a prescription which suggests that lambda over m, but it goes more like one order, order one over square root m. So it would increase, well, it would decrease more slowly with more observations. And the amusing thing is that even so, for instance, in Vapnik's book and his papers, he essentially argues for model selection to have order one over square root m. In the SVM, that works really well. He, if he practically picks the one over m, which is essentially the scaling that you would expect from being Bayesian. Um, so that's just a small side note. So therefore, what this tells you is that sometimes even the rates that you get by being very careful and frequentist may lead you down the garden path. So that's why in practice, unless you really, really know what you're doing, use cross-validation. And only if you're really an expert, go and use your theorems. Because it's so easy to get bad constants and bad rates from your theorems. OK, so this sums it up for today. I think we have a lot of SVM classification we optimized. We looked at nonlinear kernels and nonlinear SVMs, soft margin, and robustness. So I think a lot of ground that we covered today. It may not seem that much, but there's actually a lot of ideas in there. Um, yeah, and I'll see you next week.